Hey, this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science, a podcast for data science enthusiasts where I interview practitioners, researchers and calculators about their journey, experience and talk all things about data science. Welcome to Chai with great researchers and professors, CTDS dot show. In this episode, I interview Professor Laura Lial Tashe, who's a professor at the Technical University of Munich and head of the Dynamic Vision and Learning Group. We talk about her research interests and her journey into research, all of the different areas that she's been contributing to, and how does a research pipeline for her look like? Things that she's learned out of contributing to all of these areas and her advice is to PhD student, PhD students or students aspiring to find, find their path into research or computer vision, generally speaking. Laura has also been teaching a few courses at her university and we dive into common mistakes that students make, her favorite advices to students of all levels and general discussions about research. So without further ado, here's the conversation. Please enjoy the show. Hi, everyone. I'm interviewing Dr. Laura Lial Tashe today. Laura, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So uh, you've had a very interesting journey into computer vision. If I may, I'd, I'd love to start by talking about uh, how did you get interested in computer vision? Your first master thesis was on segmentation. How, how did you get interested mm-hmm. in computer vision? Uh, well, it's interesting. So I, I started in Barcelona and there we had some courses, very few actually on image processing. So that was already very interesting. But my first, let's say, contact with computer vision was in Boston when I went there for my master's thesis at Northeastern University. And there I took a course called computer vision. And I thought, wow, this is this is really cool stuff. Right. And then the master's thesis was also about segmentation. So there was also some computer vision in there. Uh, but of course, very, very different from the computer vision that we do nowadays. Right. So, I mean, there were no neural networks back then. I was looking at, at um, segmenting cells from uh, microscope images. And uh, we were using techniques like, for example, histogram thresholding to find out interesting parts of the cell versus non-interesting parts. And then snakes and these kind of techniques that probably, let's say the young generation, I think maybe haven't even heard of. <laughs> Yeah. What, what are filters? What are you talking about? I, I'm just skimming through your paper. I can see uh, a diagram that says you use pre-processing. What is that for? Uh, <laughs> you, you have to check probability and do inner boundary segmentation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Everything was very handcrafted back at the time. Right. So, so we used to like extract features, which were simply like the histogram of the images. And, and we had histogram of cells and histogram of background. And this is basically how, not even in a machine learning way, but but in a more like find the right threshold way. So so um, let's say um, normal intelligence, not artificial ones. And and this gave us sort of the the starting point then of where the cell could be. And then we had an algorithm that essentially was um, was contour based. So. Uh, there was the contour starting from the outer part of the image and closing in towards the interesting region um, until basically it hit the boundary of these of these interesting pixels according to the histogram, right? Um, and I, I mean, nowadays, of course, you could replace this whole thing, put AlexNet or whatever simple network you want on top, and it would work so much better, right? But but uh, to your point, even HOGs still work quite well, although many people haven't heard of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, actually, I'm, I'm quite a big advocate of like young students learning 
let's say what they are now called old techniques right because <laughs> you can techniques. still yeah exactly you can still learn a lot from them right and and you see often like the reappearance of these techniques in a in a deep version um kind of infusing all the knowledge that we had before into deep networks for example this is quite popular nowadays um so i think it's always good to know what techniques are out there um classic and new and and learned and not learned and then you will have um then the all the information to choose what technique is best for your problem absolutely uh, how how were you uh, solving these problems were you using uh, open cv uh, was, was it out at that time uh, i'm i'm not too sure i mean don't tell my students right but i was using matlab Okay. um which i i love personally right but but now my sister be like oh no what is what is happening <laughs> um so yeah I, i was actually i used matlab for my master thesis for my phd so everything was pretty much matlab or c++ if if we had to run things fast and then at that point we used a lot of open cv okay uh and you've picked a traditional route if i mean academia mm-hmm. uh, why, why did you pick research over industry was there any any reason or were you always drawn to research yeah so i wasn't always drawn to research that that's for sure i i didn't even want to do a phd before doing my master thesis so so that's definitely not the case um also my path i would not say it's traditional kind of i mean th- there's no traditional path in academia right i mean you can do phd postdoc longer postdoc shorter postdoc some people go to industry and then come back um for me i just found out that the skills i had match much more the academic world than the industry world so i i didn't like programming so much and now for example that i see my students i mean they are programming beasts right i mean i don't even get into into how they program things and what i like to do is i i like to think about problems and think about solutions for those problems from let's say a high level and so all this idea of going to a company and spend hours programming i was like, this is not really my path and so that that's how i ended up in academia i think that was quite the natural progression uh this was a question to toastin which also uh, applies really well to you uh, toastin satil uh, mm-hmm. you you've uh, done research in different countries have you seen any similarities or differences in cultures or any things you liked or disliked uh, from different countries and maybe their cultures if if there was any difference i think that i mean in europe i have been uh, for phd and postdoc mostly in german speaking countries so they are quite similar to each other let's say culture wise especially compared to southern europe which is where i'm from right mm. i mean there of course it's very very different but i would say in central europe it's it's quite similar i mean they have a very strong um let's say university culture i would say so so they really believe in in the public system for for education uh, they believe in the research that is happening at universities they also believe in the contact between university and industry so i think like the whole network is very very powerful for both industry and academia and compared to the us i think it's um let's say it's a bit easier i think to get funding for example uh, at least that's what i've heard of course i've never been a professor in the us but what i've heard is that it's it's quite challenging to get funding um but i found in the us that when i was there for brief periods of time during my phd i found that the environment is very very exciting right so in the lab people are like phd students postdocs they are very excited about the research about what they do and this is the kind of excitement that i try to bring back also to my group here here in munich um so diving into research uh what does a research pipeline for you look like and i'd love to dive into any one of her papers just to understand how how's the process for you how do you come up with an idea to the mm-hmm. end result so uh, if you could just speak to that yeah well every paper is its own world right Definitely. um so there are some papers that i just you know i listen to to talks um either inside the group we have for example weekly journal club talks in which people discuss state of the art interesting papers maybe papers that have won an award at cpr or nurips 
Um, we discuss it, why is this paper interesting? What do you think the impact can be? And this can often bring sort of like a pool of ideas, right? On how to use that paper for a different application or someone that had a problem now suddenly says, oh, I could apply a similar idea as that paper did. So sometimes these, these kind of natural things happen. Um, other times I just, you know, have an idea out of the blue and we say, okay, let's try it out. You know, if it's more like the, the crazy type of idea. Um, but most of the time it's, it's kind of the boring path towards getting an idea, right? Which means you take a look at your problem, you analyze what is not working and you try to find a solution for it. Simple as that. And this requires, of course, quite a lot of work from, from PhD students in understanding the problem, a lot of meetings in which you talk about possible solutions until you know you hit the right one and then you go from there. Otherwise, how do you come up with these ideas? How do you find ideas that are worth pursuing? Dima, uh, Dima Damain mentioned she's always uh, full of ideas and her time doesn't allow her to pursue those ideas. Is it the same for you? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. So right now I have quite a large group. Um, and so, you know, I can have tons of ideas and, and a lot of people are working on these ideas. Um, we also have a lot of master students, which, which is nice because it allows us to try maybe smaller ideas or, or ideas that we find a bit too crazy. And we say, well, you know, we don't know whether that will work, then we give it to a master student. Um, but in general, I think it's about you know, just listening, for example, to other talks of, of something that you completely are unfamiliar with. Um, like, for example, when Transformers appeared, I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I, I looked at a bunch of videos on YouTube, lectures or, or, you know, anything that I could find. And this sort of gives you a new view on the problem that then sparks a bunch of ideas, right? So usually this um, actually having material online is very, very useful because you can educate yourself in, in a bunch of topics and subtopics, you know, with as much detail as you want. And this always sparks a lot of ideas, right? Um, and often these, like why I look at these videos is because for example, I have to prepare for a lecture and, and I'm looking for material on how to best explain the topic um, how, how to explain the details so that the students understand. And, you know, going through all of these videos, you find out more and more details. And this has often sparked um, a lot of ideas, to be honest. Uh, YouTube has its own independent community on, uh, I was skimming through the comments on your lectures. Everyone has mentioned you're one of the best professors they've ever attended. Uh, oh, a wow. Thank from. you. <laughs> oh, I did. I didn't know this. Oh, that's nice to hear. Uh, so for students uh, who don't have you as an advisor, how should they find these ideas uh, just by reading papers or uh, what, what suggestions do you have for them to find interesting ideas or pursuing? I mean, I think that having a good group culture, like for example, if you're a PhD student, having a good group culture where you listen to the other um, students, for example, other topics and try to learn how the other students are working, what kind of techniques they are using, even if the problem is completely different, sometimes you will get ideas, right? Because they will present some technique which is completely unfamiliar to you. And then you'll be like, oh, but this is, you know, something I might use for my project, for example. Or, um, you know, doing, for example, these journal clubs, I think is a great way that where my students get to prepare a paper, for example, really in detail. So they get to understand it in detail and then present it to everyone else. This is also a great way for me not to have to read all the papers from all the <laughs> conferences, right? Because it has become completely <laughs> crazy to do this. Um, so, so I think that having a good group culture helps a lot. I see my students, they help each other very much. They tell each other, oh, this is an interesting paper or this is an interesting piece of code or this is how to make things more efficient on the GPU. And you know, all of these things, I think make you a better researcher and, and make you also a better programmer. So I think this is, um, this is one way of, of doing it. I think an important way, of course, the obvious way is going to conferences. This mm -hmm. is usually the week where I get most of the ideas, right? Just by talking to people, seeing other presentations, this is just a, 
incredibly creative we. Um, and otherwise, I would say always trying to, to learn more and more about anything that you're interested in, even if it, you think that it will not be applicable immediately to what you're doing. You know, you never know in the future. Absolutely. Uh, I've sort of invested my life savings into this PC. Uh, I'm not an indie researcher. I try to kaggle sometimes. But uh, what I found useful just for the audience is there are also online journal clubs where you can go to. Uh, I, I'm not part of a rich uh, PhD club, but they also have very interesting discussions if mm-hmm. we can just drop in on an online discussion. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know about this actually, but it, but it's a very interesting initiative. For the audiences, there are many uh, independent groups that keep happening every week and then it's it's easier to get a hold of them, but they, they're usually small. So that's also helpful in different ways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So coming back to research uh, and maybe just using your paper from this year's new rips, uh, make one short video object segmentation efficient again. Uh, mm-hmm. Once you've come up with the idea, how does the pipeline for you look like? And uh, how do you go about running those experiments? How, wh- what happens afterwards? And wh- what do we not get to see in the paper? Oh, you should ask my PhD <laughs> student this because I, I'm not going to even be able to tell half of the story, right? So actually this paper um, involved a lot of work from his side, I have to be honest. Um, we didn't start with the problem of segmentation, but he had been working on meta learning for quite a while. And I have to say it's quite a hard um, topic to, to grasp. So to really know when your model is training properly, how it should behave, this is quite hard. It's not you know, the usual training the network, looking at the curves and seeing what happens. Uh, But it's sometimes very unintuitive, right? So he spent quite a lot of time into understanding how meta learning works, even if it was for another topic. And then at some point, we had done this this paper in 2017 with some colleagues at ETH, the the original OSVOS paper, that kind of now everyone was criticizing, saying, oh, it takes forever to, to train that model. And I thought, oh, this, you know, this, this is the perfect setup in which to apply meta learning, right? Um, and this is kind of how, how the whole thing started. And then once you have the idea, you know, the idea doesn't work at all for the first at least three, four months. So this was actually very, very painful. We wanted to go for ICCV, didn't happen. Um, and that's, that's pretty much why we ended up for NIRIPS. Um, but I remember it required a lot of GPU hours, a lot of work from his side in really understanding all the tiny details. Like they are so important, all the tiny details in, in this paper, in, in meta learning in general, a bit more than in the other papers, I would say. There's, there's some tenacity uh, that I've learned, uh, a lot of it actually in, in research, uh, but what, what, what should one do when, when they hit a roadblock and nothing's working? I mean, the thing that I think helps is, is just talking about the problem with someone, right? So usually we have weekly meetings, um, me and, and the PhD students, and we just talk about what things are not working, right? And we go into as much detail as needed, like looking at training curves, Visualization helps a lot. So so try to visualize everything that you can, variables, gradients, results, anything. I mean, this is really the only way. Of course, this takes a lot of time, but otherwise it's it's really impossible to find out what is the problem unless you can really visualize every little step of of the algorithm and what's happening. And of course, with neural networks, this is not always straightforward, but... Yeah, that that's probably why it took quite a lot to uh, to get to the bottom of this paper. Nothing works until it does. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. So uh, you've you've contributed to many interesting areas of research: uh, generative networks, segmentation problems, uh, post estimation problems. W- what are your current research interests, and what what does a day in your life look like? What what are your role? Uh, what what all does your role involve? Um, well, a day in my life looks like meetings all day <laughs> with uh, PhD students mostly, uh, but also with, um, with master's students um, at least twice a month. And um, the idea is, is always to have a meeting to discuss current progress, right? 
Um, so some PhD students know pretty much what they want to do. So after finishing their paper, they themselves will tell me, oh, I want to, you know, go down this, this route and, and do this other paper. Then we discuss about it. We come up with ideas and, and they get started. So it's a pretty natural process. For others, I might have an idea and I try to convince people, you know, to, to do this idea and, and to follow it. Um, and nowadays I'm interested um, still quite a lot in, in human analysis. So anything that has to do with tracking segmentation, uh, we're working, as you said, on, on generative models, mostly for privatization, because um, when you say you're working on, on multiple object tracking, the first thing that people say is, oh, you're doing you know, big brother surveillance, all of these things. And we're trying to find a way of actually not leaking any uh, private data and still you know, be able to develop algorithms for, uh, for tracking, for example, which are very useful for autonomous driving, right? Um, so trying to, to merge the privacy and, and one of my, my favorite topics, which is tracking and segmentation. Uh, the other two, I think, are somewhat obvious, but what's the challenge with uh, tracking humans? Uh, what, what's the challenging part in that? Well, um, I don't know if you have checked our, um, our benchmark, Mod Challenge. We uh -huh. opened it in 2014. And at the beginning, you know, there were these scenes where, you know, there were like four pedestrians walking around. And, you know, pedestrian went behind a pole and that was, you know, the biggest challenge, a pedestrian going behind the pole and getting partially occluded, right? Which is kind of completely ridiculous for nowadays standards. And if we look, for example, at, at the Mod 20 challenge that we have recently opened, this is completely crazy. This is, you know, hundreds of people, every frame, walking around, occlusions everywhere. So I think when you look at those scenes, you can already see how many challenges we have, right? So it's not only about detecting those pedestrians because you, you cannot, like physically, you cannot detect so many pedestrians and be correct all the time. So it's a lot about reasoning about what a pedestrian can do or, or how a pedestrian can move when it's occluded by other pedestrians or, or when it's walking behind the tree. So there's a lot of trajectory prediction and there's also a lot of um, appearance disambiguation, right? Because when you have 200 people in your scene, everyone starts looking like someone on the other side of the image, right? So mm. even re-identification is not so straightforward when you have this large number of people. So I think all of these challenges are starting to, to now come together in, in these new data sets that we're launching. What's your intuition? How, how would we be able to solve it? Uh, there are also limits to the camera resolution. Uh, like mm -hmm. you said, uh, multiple cameras. Uh, in terms of hardware, do you think multiple cameras could be an answer? And in terms of architectures, do you have any intuition of what might be helpful? Mm -hmm. So I think multiple cameras helps a lot, especially with occlusions. Just having another camera could solve the occlusion altogether. So if you want to do really precise tracking, then having a multi-camera system is, is the best solution there is. Um, we usually work, uh, at least on, on the data set, with um, just monocular views because we want to kind of have the isolated challenge, right? So, I mean, if you can have the help of another camera, then the problem becomes easier, but usually it doesn't become harder. So we want to tackle the hardest problem, right? Um, and nowadays, I'm, I'm very interested in applying um, graph neural networks for, uh, for tracking. I think they are quite a nice tool. And you can also change how graph neural networks behave so that they fit the tracking problem, right? So it's not just like taking the tool and applying it, but actually really adapting the operations within in order to have uh, the best outcome for this particular problem. And so we're looking uh, into this direction. We had this CPR 20 paper on, on this topic, and we're looking to expand this a little bit more to target um, long-term occlusion. So when the pedestrian is really occluded for a long time, that is something that we found pretty much all methods are ignoring because it's really, really hard. And so we're trying to, to tackle these kind of problems now. Okay. Um Zooming out of uh, your research interest now, uh, 
are there any domains outside of the ones that you've contributed to that really fascinate you and you you would like to work on or uh, are just fascinating in general mm-hmm. well i really like um the um well one domain in which we have started contributing which is uh, visual localization mm-hmm. um so in which um i started because because thorsten was uh, has been working on this for a long time like he's one of the of the experts in the field and i got interested because there was very few learning inside the the whole um the whole field and so i told him look i mean we could do something with learning here i think there's potential and he was a bit skeptical at first you know but then he i think the idea grew grew on him and and nowadays there's quite a lot of learning in visual localization i have to say but i find it fascinating to have this mix of learning plus the constraints of for example multiple view geometry right i mean i think this this idea of mixing constraints with the freedom of of the learned models is something that is very interesting and that people are also starting to um to use a lot in computer vision um so that's one area they find interesting for this particular reason i also like a lot the, the whole medical domain uh mainly because of the potential applications or or let's say outcomes that it can have right um so for me um, whenever some some doctor comes and says you know what can you do with these images then i say oh yeah you know we could segment these we could find the tumor i don't know things like this i mean they are so happy right because they they didn't know that this was possible and for them it opens up a completely new world and for me it opens up somehow the the path towards doing something that has an impact in another field. field like for example the medical field which is of course really important and and so it's kind of exciting right to see that you can have also an impact in other fields like the, the medical or biomedical field and do do you think the the uh, limited applications are because uh, an expert hasn't looked at the problem yet uh, there are, are there any uh, low hanging fruits that are just untapped because no one has looked at them i think so i think so definitely um we had like for example we have a collaboration with um astrophysicists and they were just at, at the beginning it was just a casual conversation right um so i met this um professor uh, that's at mpi in munich and she she's an astrophysicist and was telling me about her problem and then i said oh yeah sure this we can do with deep learning right and she was like oh what is what is this you know and so it it kind of started in this way and i think the hardest thing for people outside of the domain is that they don't know how to pose their problem so that it mm. can be digested by a neural network right so how much data do i need for example like they give me two images and then they're like what can you do with this and i'm like well nothing right i mean they're just two images right so the scale of the images that you need also sometimes massaging the problem so that it can have a clear input and output this is also something that that is somehow i mean it's hard to think about if you if you're not in this mindset um so sometimes it's just about explaining what we can do and what we need as input output and then slowly they get to a point where they understand what a neural network can do how it does it and then we can go ahead and and do really cool things um there's another aspect uh, of your your work uh, which all professors have to do uh, coming to that which is teaching uh, mm-hmm. what's uh, one thing you've enjoyed while teaching students and are there any mistakes that you've observed uh, i'm sure the audience would be very varied there would be a mix of undergrad and uh, master students do, do you see any common mistakes between different levels um you mean mistakes of the students or mine yes. because <laughs> they're mistakes both. of the students <laughs> <laughs> mistakes of the students well um so so first of all just to give a little context so i do teach introduction to deep learning which is a super broad lecture um and this involves undergraduate and graduate students and this means that so the main problem we have there is that the knowledge is just too diverse right so there's some people that say this course is too easy some people that say this course is impossible i mean 
it, it's normal, right? Because some person has just started the bachelor and the other person is finishing the master's, right? And they are both in the course. Um, but I think that probably one mistake that students do, it's, I don't know whether to call it a mistake, right? But it's the feeling that we need to provide the students everything and they don't have to do anything for the course aside from following all the rules, right? So they say, okay, if I look at all the videos and if I do all the exercises, then I have to pass this course, right? And th this is not really it, right? It's not a cookbook that you follow the steps and then you get to the end point, right? I mean, you need to have also your own interests. You need to get interested into the topic, even look further into other references, ask questions, um, discuss with other students, go in depth also into the exercises. So I think that the whole learning process is much, much more complex than, than what you see usually in the lectures online, right? Which is a nice video, it's well prepared. Yes, the exercises are well prepared, but the work that the student has to do is just much larger than that. And I think that's something that sometimes um, it's hard to grasp, I think, for the, for the students to get into this mentality, right? Do, do you think masters or uh, more advanced students are easier, have, have that mindset uh, of, of doing their own homework, if I may? Honestly, no. I, I found <laughs> um, first, <laughs> yeah, no, that's true, right? I think it depends on the character, to be honest. It also depends on the interest, right? I mean, there were also courses at university that I did. I had zero interest in them. I, di I did not put this passion into the course, right? Mm. Um, but there are some students that really, so either they are really disciplined, I have to say, and then th they do it because they are sort of taught to do it, or um, they really like the topic. And then it doesn't matter what level they are. I've seen first year bachelor students having the best grade at introduction to deep learning and doing all the exercises and asking questions and asking really advanced questions. And, and I've seen master students that they completely don't care. So, I mean, th this doesn't depend on the level for sure. Okay, makes sense. Um, apart from that, people who are taking online lectures, uh, trying to break into the field, maybe, maybe into a course or into the industry, do you have any best advices on what resources to follow, how to get them? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think I have sort of two answers here, right? So one answer is the answer I would give to people who are starting and whom I now see that they are getting very focused from the beginning. Hmm. And this is probably because you start and you say, oh, I want to do a PhD at a, a really good university. And you see that you need to have three CPR papers to get into a PhD <laughs> now at Stanford, something like this, right? More Which, than three at I mean, this point. <laughs> I mean, it's complete madness, right? At this point, I just give you the PhD already. Um, and of course, these people, they have to start from the bachelor, from the first year doing computer vision, right? I mean, th there's no other way. And I think this is the problem because you kind of forget all the basics that you still need to do good research, right? Basics in math, basics in physics, or even other courses, I don't know, optimization, other courses that, that you might be interested in, um, these students, I think, don't have the luxury of taking courses just because they enjoy it. And, you know, we will see what happens in the future if I do computer vision or not, right? Um, so right now they are, they are just starting really heavily focused on computer vision. And I think this gives them an, a very narrow view of the world and of the field. And this leads to people that, I think potentially will be less creative in the future, right? Because they will have always seen this, this really narrow view. Um, so one thing that I would recommend students who start is don't forget the basics, you know, also enjoy other courses. There's no need to be so focused. Um, and as, as far as the, the, let's say, other half maybe of, of the audience who might be interested in, well, I already have a bachelor or a master's, but I want to get into computer vision, right? So what resources um, do I need to look at? Um, if you're interested in doing a PhD, I would recommend getting an internship somewhere, some university with a professor that, that you know, you like his or her research, 
and you just say, look, I want to come as an intern. Usually it's hard to say no, because this is in the end work sort of for free, right? For the professor. Um, so if he or she has capacity to, to guide the person and has interest, usually this happens and, and this is fairly easy to get. And then you are already in this, in this group that I was talking about before, right? The group that is interested in computer vision that does all these activities together where you can learn from, not only learn from your project, but learn from everyone, right? Learn from the advisor, learn from your colleagues. So I think this is a great way to get started. Of course, before the PhD, do all the classic things, right? Look at Coursera. There's so much material online nowadays that, I mean, even I learn from videos online from other professors on a subject I don't know, right? So I think students now have all this material available, which is a good thing because you can find pretty much any content online. It's a bad thing because the question is, where do I start, right? Which course <laughs> do I take? So that's, that's hard, but I think that there's also lots of forums that they recommend courses. Um, they recommend also exercises, practical, for example, Kaggle competitions. Whenever there's a student that says, you know, I did three Kaggle competitions, I think that's a good person, right? That's a person that is interested in the topic and that, you know, without anyone asking, started competing with, with the whole world, basically, right? So these are the kind of things that tell me that a person is interested and, and would be a potential good PhD candidate. And from there, well, then the, the doors start to open, right? You start publishing, you get internships. So eventually it, it's pretty easy to land a good job, I would say, after a PhD. Do you have any favorite project, uh, sorry, uh, courses that you recommend? Uh, any ones that you'd want to name? Favorite courses? Well, I started when I Courses or, the, the... or books, any resources. Okay, okay. Um, well, obviously, the I mean, I don't even need to say it, right? But the, the deep learning for computer vision course of Stanford that, that uh, Karpathy started. The Karpathy one also, or the latest one? <laughs> I mean, any, right? I mean, I think the material just keeps improving. I have to be honest. I checked. I checked it when I prepared my course just to have an idea on, you know, how they do it, how to structure the course. And, but I see that the material has improved really a lot. It, it, they have really expanded it and, and it's really crazy how much material is in there right now. So I think that's a great starting point. Otherwise I've heard um, a lot of good things also about the, how is it called? Deep, deep AI or something like deep that. Deep learning.ai? Yeah, exactly. I've heard also very good things about that. Also about a um, lot of practical exercises that help you get also into the mindset of, of a data scientist, basically. And then from there, you can start looking at lectures which are more specific, right? Like, for example, my lecture on detection, segmentation and tracking, which is then specific if you're interested in that. Um, or a lecture maybe on multiple view geometry, if you're, if you're interested in the 3D world. Like for example, um, Professor Kremers also has an excellent uh, lecture online. And he, I mean, he said it since forever, right? So, so much before um, this, this trend of putting the lectures online came. And honestly, everyone that I talked to has, has listened to that lecture one time or another. So it, it's really, really popular. Um, so yeah, I would say that after this, probably you start you start narrowing it down, and there are less and less courses which are specialized. But you you'll find your way around. I think that's um, the most important part is just to start. Awesome. Uh, this is again. I'm sort of repeating the last question, but this is the question that I usually end the podcast on because I always get very uh, diverse answers. What's your best advice to someone who's just starting their journey today? Um, I would say, maybe that's a bit typical, right? But I would say always be curious, right? Um, so once you stop learning, you start thinking that you know, you think you know everything and that's always a bad place to be. Right. So so I thought that, you know, when I finish my PhD um, or when I become a professor, well, by then I will know a lot of things and, you know, I will not need to learn anymore. 
And that, that's really far from what's happening, right? So, so the coolest part of my work is to learn new things. And the field is evolving so fast that you need to do this. You need to update yourself. So I think that one of the, of the things that you need to have to get into this field is this mentality that you will learn forever and that your skills need to change. And you need to have these basics that, that I was talking about before in order to put then all the new content on top and make sense of it, right? Um, so once you have these basics, um, I would then go for online lectures, a lot of coding, um, a lot of trying things out because I can tell you that, you know, the network is overfitting if the curve looks like this, but until you see it, until you see the effect <laughs> on your problem, like th there is really nothing like it. So a lot of trial and error. Until you spend a, a hundred, a few hundred dollars on wasted experiments, you wouldn't know the pain. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Uh, that's that's a great advice to end the podcast on. Uh, Laura, you are at L-E-A-L-T-A-I-X-E -E on Twitter. Any other platforms where the audience can connect with you? Um, I think Twitter is the best one. I mean, I also have um, a website um, where you can find an email there. You can send me an email if you wish. Uh, but I think Twitter is probably the fastest way where, where people can drop me a message. Okay, I'll have your Twitter for anyone who didn't type those let letters into the screen uh, in the show notes as well. <laughs> Laura, thanks so much again for your time and for an insightful conversation. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. This was this was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.